Welcome to another episode of Boardroom Conversations, the WhatProp Business Podcast. Today we have a very special guest with us. It's Nick Dreyer, who's the co-founder of Faltzkin Shoes. Faltzkin Shoes has very humble beginnings, starting in a four square meter office in Cape Town and building a global shoe brand to be sold in 32 countries globally. This podcast will seek to unpack the amazing story that Nick and his partner have been on since 2015, having their shoes worn by Prince Harry and Ashton Kutcher Join us today as we unpack the amazing Falskin story. Thank you for joining us for this boardroom conversation. I'm your host, Justin Watkins. Just a quick one before this episode begins, I'd really encourage you to like, share and subscribe we are on youtube and spotify boardroom conversations the what prop business podcast please also go follow us on linkedin to keep up to date with the latest episodes thank you nick thank you so much for the opportunity to to come on the boardroom conversation today um i really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and obviously for you to unpack not only your personal story but also the falskin story um for us today just from a personal perspective let's start just in your personal capacity. Tell us your story leading up to actually starting Faltzkin um, in like 2015-ish, and let's take it from there. Sure, thank you so much for having me. It's, a, it's always a privilege to be able to tell our story, and, um, and it's always nice to speak to nice people that have, have done good things, so it's lovely to be here. So my story coming up to 2015, when this whole thing kicks off, I've, I've, I'm blessed, I've had a very interesting life by my standards, I think, at least. Um, my formative years were spent in Swaziland. Um, I grew up in a, a little town called Mbaban, and I schooled at a town called Mshlam and Yatsi uh, at the Usutu Forest Primary School with 62 other students. So I had this very small uh, rural upbringing, which I loved, and then came back to South Africa and went to school at Pretoria Boys as a boarder. My folks were in, in the garden route. And then I ended up studying. It was a strange time, 1996, I matriculated. The country was going through its post-first election teething trauma. It was an uncertain time. And I chose to study hospitality management with a view of maybe going to spend time in the world. Uh, in the world. And I, I started in hospitality, studied it, and then started a career firstly at the Bay Hotel, but ended up critically and pivotally at Element House in Bantry Bay, quite haphazardly and by mistake. I had no idea I was working at the hotel where one of South Africa's great business leaders and patriots, Paul Harris, owned it. And uh, I ended up uh, 15 years later having spent most of my formative business years with Paul. Um, and, uh, and I was blessed to be exposed to lots of different businesses and activity through him. Um, and then start my own thing at the age of 36, which is now well documented. Um, clearly, I, I, I was in an enormous hurry to start failing. <laughs> so I then left the tent of Paul and then started my own businesses and just failed in a hurry. And that, is, that was my world. And then on a personal front, I just got married um, to my wife Freya and we were expecting our firstborn and it was in the midst of all this chaos and failure and a new children and a new baby and a new marriage when 2015 arrives. So so 2015 rolls around yeah. take us from there how does it how did it go from there? Completely by mistake so it, it, just contextually my failure was so spectacular that I was dealing with a, a business that not only had failed, but had dug itself an enormous hole that had to be sorted out. Yeah. And it was too big for me to do on my own. Consequently, my, my mate, who I went to school with, Ross Zonda, was also struggling. He was a builder, and um, he was struggling with his business. And we were phoning each other regularly as mates, just to talk. And um, this moment comes around where I'm driving from Plett to Cape Town, and he's driving around in his bucky somewhere in Cape Town, probably disappointing someone. <laughs> so, and and um, I phoned him up saying, I've got a six hour car journey. 
like I'll go phone you every night and talk a bit of rubbish. And uh, I think it was about an hour in we had this conversation. And like we all do, it's like, listen, did you see the news yesterday? Did you see? And I said to him, did you see the Olympics a couple of weeks ago? He's like, yeah. I said, did you see how rubbish they looked in their track sheets? And, and he was like, yeah, dude, I, I saw it. And I was like, why can't they just wear something that looks South African? Like the Congolese have all this cool color and the French have a beret and yeah. they, the Yanks have the Tommy Hilfiger suits or whatever it is. I was like, why can't we just go out and look South African? And Ross was like, yeah, but what would we wear? And it was an interesting question in the moment. And I said to him, well, maybe we should have worn Madiba shirts. And he was like, yeah, but really the only guy that makes Madiba shirts cool is Madiba. And I was like, yeah, I've got to agree with you. And then we couldn't think of anything. Like, what is ours? What, well, I mean, if I if you saw you walking down the street, what would make you a South African? You know, yeah. Yeah, Aussies have a kookaburra hat or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So I said, well, the one thing that we all have that we know is a felt skin. <laughs> and we don't give each other credit for who said what, but yeah. one of us said, yeah, but dude, like nobody wears felt skins. We all know what a felt skin is. And then the other person said, but why does a felt skin have to be boring? Sure. That was the start. That, that asking that question in that car was the moment. Because what happens next is a combination of luck, hard work, serendipity, magic, and total opportunistic endeavor. It, and and it, it happened to two of the least likely people to ever participate in this particular business. So I said to Ross, why don't I send this off to, I've got this kid that works for me, he, he can Photoshop. Why don't we ask him to just put color soles and laces on? So Ross goes, okay, cool. So I phone the guy up and I'm in the car. And I say to the young guy, do me a favor, just put color la laces and soles on. And he says, do you want any other colors? Haphazardly I go, make it the colors of the South African flag. And I get a WhatsApp with the images, but he sends it to me and Ross. And he's now Photoshopped a pair of shoes. The colors are yellow soles, yellow laces. But when you flick the images, the, the shoe stays one image because it's been photoshopped yeah. and, he's, and just the colors changed. And I remember Ross and myself being on speakerphone talking to each other when we got it. And we were like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> like we've seen something that you just can't unsee. And then the conversation starts. Okay, cool. This needs to happen. We have to start a shoe business. We need to start the Feldskin business. What should we call it? And it was under the premise that the South African team needs to wear this at the next Olympics. Conversation goes and it goes hard between two mates. Now, normally these things, whether it's a bit at a bri or between you and me on the phone, yeah. like they normally fizzle out. What was remarkable about this is by the time I arrived in Cape Town four and a half hours later, Feltskin PTY Limited was registered with SIPSI. And we had put in the application to trademark the word Feltskin in the soul of South Africa. And nobody had ever done it. And that was how it started. So no one had ever taken the opportunity no. and yet 300 years of brand equity. Available to take. And no one had ever taken the opportunity. No one had ever done it. Nobody had ever made it cool. Nobody had ever called it what it was. Because it was obviously a boring, well, relatively well, boring brown shoe that yeah. everyone wore. Mm. But it wasn't stylish. It wasn't trendy. Yeah. Turns out it was really stylish in Europe. The Clark's Desert Boot, unbeknownst to almost every South African, is a direct descendant of a Feltskin. Clark himself fought in Rommel's army against Rommel in the northern parts of Africa with the, with the Allied forces. Clark then fights alongside South African soldiers who had cut their boots, three quarters, natural hide, Feltskins, in the war to march easier in the sand. Clark goes back to England, this is documented, and calls it the desert boot. And it came from South African soldiers. Steve McQueen wears it. It becomes one of the coolest things in the world. But here in South Africa, the Feltskin stays the good old Feltskin. Meantime, it's the grandfather of one of the coolest things in the world. So what we immediately identified was that this thing was South African. This thing was amazing. It had color, it had that Mzamzi magic, but there's only two of us that are seeing it right now in this period of yeah. time. Yeah. So we had to get started. You know, and how do you start if you know nothing about shoes, nothing about fashion, you have zero money? How do you begin? And that was the challenge for the next phase. So, so now you've obviously come up with this wild idea with your partner, Ross. Yeah. 
and you're standing there and you've got these crazy, crazy shoes. On WhatsApp. On WhatsApp. <laughs> the company's registered. Yeah. So you just had the standard design of a felt skirt. Yes. So you take that shoe now. How did it go from there? So I'm, I remind you, we had no idea what, how to do this. And Ross and I aren't the most tech savvy guys, or we weren't. We're a bit better now. <laughs> so we built a site. The first, we knew that we couldn't afford to buy shoes or at that point. We first had to learn, and we first had to figure out if this could happen. And the big buzz at the time was e-commerce. So we decided the best course of action would be e-commerce, but we wanted to test it first. So we built a site, and um, a commercial site so that you could buy stuff. Yeah. And then we started a Facebook page and an Instagram page, and we got our brand done ourselves we did this by the way at night because we were still failing during the day on our usual stuff so we were doing this at night um mostly between 11 and 2 it was quite surprising to us when the world went to zoom during um covid because that's kind of how we built felt skin is yeah. apart and online yeah. so we built the site and we have this facebook page and i put out a campaign <laughs> that said the legend is back Again, claiming 300 yeah. years worth of brand degree. Yeah. The legend is back and I put it out there and we turn it on on a Tuesday and we're like, okay, cool, the site's live, the Facebook's live. Let's see if South Africa responds. Ross phones me three days later saying, did you, like, did you put money in the bank? So I said, no, I didn't, don't have any money. So he goes, but there's like money in the bank. So we look and we see and we'd sold 150 odd pairs of shoes in four days. We didn't even know it. And the problem was we were testing. So we didn't actually have shoes. We hadn't even made the shoes. We were selling the photoshopped images off our phone from the original conversation. But what it did was it immediately validated that we had a great thing going. So yeah, we phoned idea. everybody, apologized, told the truth, said, thank you, but we don't have shoes. We are intending to start this, but you're gonna have to hang in there because we have to figure it out. So you'll get your shoes hopefully in four to six months. If you want your money back, we'll give it back to you today. Otherwise, hang in there with us. And I think two people opted out and the rest all said, no, we love you. We love this idea. We love Feltskin. We want you to proceed. And that's how it started. Then we, we actually had the money to go and make the shoes. We made the shoes. We delivered them to people. And South Africa went crazy for it. And they loved it because we were celebrating South Africa. So from a timeline point of view, where are we from a timeline point so of view? So now we're sort moment? of like... It took, it took months, right? So it was sort of like mid to end 2016. Okay. That's kind of the, you know, does that make sense? Yes, yeah, more or less there. So it, 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 it took a bit of time. You know, we were doing this stuff at night. <clears throat> and then you wait to make shoes. You had to find a supply and all the rest of it. But then we were quickly off to the races. Very small. Mm. But the, the next moment was we had, um, we got an acquisition uh, question from Brown Joffe's Long for Life. And that was the, the first marker where we kind of became a real business. You know, this is just me and Ross. Yeah. yeah. So now you've, you've got this opportunity where people are desiring your shoes. Yes. And like, we want these shoes, but now you obviously didn't have the actual product itself. Mm. Um, so actually going from that moment, yeah. what's the moment going forward from there? Yeah, you... We knew we had something, so we started making shoes on a very small scale with a, with a manufacturer in Cape Town. And then we got the attention of Long for Life. They came to see us. It was funny because we were so unprepared for this stuff that they came to look at our business. We, we hadn't turned a million rand yet. <laughs> That's us. It was tiny. And, uh, we said, and then we have a listed company <laughs> going to ask us about our business. But they'd seen it, and a lot of people had seen it, and a lot of people could identify that the, there was something here. So they came to see us and uh, we were on our way to the UK because, and I'll get to that, Ross and I had actually figured that if we could build it in South Africa, why couldn't we build it in, in London? So they came to see me one day before we were on our way and they come into the office and they go, okay, tell us about your business and I'm speaking. They go, do you have a presentation for us? And I said, yes. And they like, what's your ask? And I put a piece of paper across the table and it was the, it was a two page presentation and the first page was the logo <laughs> the second page had five circles in it with a heading in each circle one in the middle 
the outside circles had said inventory, payroll, uh, marketing, and working capital. And the middle circle was a total of the two, of the four. And I said, there's our business, that's what I need. And they were like, you've articulated it in one page. And I was like, that's, that's what I need. And they said, okay, cool, can we meet you guys next week? And I said, no, we're in London, we're off to go and build Feltzik in the UK. And they're like, what do you mean? And I said, I'm getting on a plan, and we're flying to London, and Ross and I are gonna build Feltzik like we did here, and we're gonna build it in the UK. And, um, and then we'll be back in about two weeks' time. And they couldn't believe it. And they said, okay, cool, please don't, please don't talk to anybody. And so we said, okay, cool, we'll see you when we're back. And we came back and we did a deal and they took 49% of our business. We've subsequently bought it back, but um, that's our first investor was a listed company. So 2016, you get a flight. this massive investment. Yeah. Well, not um, massive, well, mass, not a rounding error in their terms, but in our world, <laughs> sensationally big. <laughs> so, so then you've got this, you've got this investment now, you've got yeah. the backing. Yeah. And you, you're trying to hustle in the UK as well now. Yeah. So you go to the UK, what happens there? We, so Harry, Prince Harry wears the shoes. That's the first thing that happens. Was well, this just a random yeah. occurrence that he wore the shoes? So, we, so basically we got it. And when I say we opened the UK, people often, and your viewers mustn't mistake what I'm talking about. We're not talking about going there and opening an office in the UK and like, this is what opening in the UK is. Two guys with economy tickets on Emirates that allows you to take two 22 and a half kilogram bags each which is exactly 50 pairs of Feltskin with 50 flat pack boxes each. We flew with 100 pairs. Now, you, you can work out for yourself that yeah. we had nothing else, yeah. okay? Yeah. We show up at the cheapest Airbnb we can possibly find. We put on our tracksuit pants and shirts. We go to the Leo's Tesco to buy provisions. We then build a site, Instagram, all the rest of it, with the 100 pairs in the room. We then start selling them and shipping them to customers with the Royal Mail. 12 days later, we leave the shoes with a friend of ours in his apartment and we bugger off back to South Africa. That's what opening the UK looks like in real, in real terms. But we were live and we were selling shoes in the UK. So we've got shoes going. Sure. We're kind of trading for a few months. We've got long for life. We've, we've made our first hire. We've hired someone. And the person we hired, people can't believe this, was a copywriter. <laughs> and the reason we hired a copywriter is because really we're a storytelling brand. We're not a shoe business. Like, of course we're a shoe business, but our job was to articulate our brand to the world and to South Africa. So we were selling shoes and we we're raising a bit of money. And um, in London again, I went alone the second time because th by this stage we could afford to put our shoes in an actual distribution center, tiny amount. <laughs> I'm doing that, and I get a phone call from the fashion editor for the Times of London, and uh, Chris, and he says to me, Nick, I was at a party last night, I was giving you a number by somebody, I, I don't even remember who, and, and Harry, Prince, he was Prince Harry then, Prince Harry was there, and he was wearing a pair of Pinotage Feltskin, and at that moment, I knew that it was us, because nobody would use the word Pinotage Feltskin, that was that, the red Feltskin's called the Pinotage. Mm. My, my first question was, Chris, do you have a photo? And he goes, no, I'm phoning you to ask you if you've got a photo. I was like, no, I don't. And he goes, tell me about the shoe. So I said, look, I give him the history of the shoe. I tell him the history about the Clarks thing. He kind of knew that. And he said, listen, can you write an article on it? So I said, yeah, absolutely. So the first Sunday comes and he writes an article about the history of Feltskin shoes. It's in the Times of London, but not us, the conceptually what a Feltskin is. It's an article in the newspaper. The next week, he runs a piece about this big in the paper. I think it had 70 words in it, saying, Prince Harry, fan of Felskin shoes. And we're, we're back in South Africa at this point, and our phone's on Shopify, I don't if you know this, but it actually goes ting yeah. when you make a sale. And it's like Sunday, I think the time difference was an hour. Sunday at about 10 o'clock in South Africa, it goes ting, my phone goes ting. Sunday, it's a quiet day in South Africa, what? Ding. I'm like, geez, I guess two sales. Wow, guys. Ding, third sale. Look at my phone. It's the UK. It's pounds. Bang, bang, bang. 
300 odd pairs of shoes in one day. And by our standards, that's enormous. That's the power of that, that, that brand, that royal brand is incredible. And the power of the, the, the UK newspaper. And immediately the UK, we got known. We're still not huge there, but we were, we were known. South Africans knew about us. The Harry thing helped us because it generated loads of press in South Africa. And it just started this engine of people being familiar with our company. And that was a very big moment of visibility. I think we made, like most of the newspapers in South Africa covered that story that Harry was wearing the shoes and that the Times of London wrote the Actually, story. I remember that. Yeah. I remember that clearly. Yeah. So Harry's not the only celebrity to mm. wear your shoes. Well, take us through how other celebrities have jumped on that bandwagon as well with your shoes. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting part of what we do. I think, firstly, let me just say, I think it, it has a lot to do with the heritage of the shoe. So a lot of people get it. It's not Ross and my business that creates that sort of interest. It's the fact that a Falskin is maybe the oldest shoe in the world, mm-hmm. the oldest shoe brand. But it's also supremely well made. And that's what a Falskin's known for. And we just added a bit of color to it and fun and magic and a little bit of Mzanzi magic and passion. And that kind of resonated with people. So on the celebrity front, Harry wears it. In South Africa, a lot of people were wearing the shoes already from a, like famous people, like especially little rugby guys, you know, John Smith's a mate of mine and uh, Minnie Lamini. And we had people that we didn't pay them or anything and we've never had an influencer. Um, but loads of people started wearing the shoes because they found them fun. I mean, Brian Joffe was wearing the shoes. <laughs> so um, we, we have this moment where the... It relates directly to our U.S. business, where Ashton Kutcher ends up wearing the shoes. And a lot of people don't know this, but the Ashton and Mark Cuban became shareholders of our U.S. business. And when people see Ashton in the shoes, they go, oh, yeah, Ashton Kutcher wears your shoes. But the truth is Ashton Kutcher and Mark Cuban were actually invested in our U.S. business. And so there's a famous picture of him wearing the shoes at a, at a basketball game. That, sh- that shot was taken the day after we concluded our deal with them in the US, where they became partners in our And business. what year was that done in? 18, yeah, 2018, mid to end 2018. So you entered the US market in 2018, you yeah. did the UK market in about 2016, 2017. Yeah, 17, yeah. yeah. Did you, when you approached the US market, were you approaching it in a similar way as you did the UK, or was it approached in a completely different manner? It was completely different. So the UK was intentional. We knew we could go and do it. We, at the same time zone, it's America's a big place, so we couldn't mm-hmm. figure out how to do it. So we were actually struggling because you'd need third-party distribution right away, and there's, some, there's way more complexity. And we, to be fair, we'd, we'd run a dead end. And in that moment of running a dead end, we actually got a, an email from a, this family called the Watts family, and uh, they, South African guy, and he said, he's just been to Durban to visit his family. He's seen the product all over the place, loves it. He's got a business in the States. Would we be interested in them doing Feltin in America? Long story short, we get talking to them. He had a, a, a niche business, a surf, a, short, a small surfboard business, which we liked because, not for the surfboard piece, but because he, he had a niche product and he could take a niche product online. We knew that Falskin would be niche. It's got a strange sounding name for an American. So we knew we'd have to work hard. It wouldn't be the same as the UK. And he had done that already. So we, we entertained it. We liked them as families. And then we got to the point where we were going to close. And, well, there's a due diligence piece. Remember, at this point, we've got a listed company in bed with us. And they, unbeknownst to us, had other partners. And so they so- showed the, the product to the other partners. They came back and said, would, would, they, would they mind if they could join the investment? And so I got a phone call. I've, I have the privilege of saying that I had a phone call saying, hi, Nick, we'd like to make this thing work with you guys in the States, but would you mind if Ashton Kutcher and Mark Cuban joined the investment? I was like, it's, <laughs> it's, not a difficult, it's not a difficult question to answer. The answer is yes, of course we would like that. And they did it because they loved the shoes. Mark Cuban loves rugby, understood South Africa, and uh, Ashton just loves the shoes. And so that's how we said yes. American lawyers and South African lawyers made it happen somehow. And uh, Ross and I then had these crazy partners. And then that made the news again, right? So all of a sudden we were on the front page of Business Day 
announcing that Ashton Kutcher and Mark Cuban had invested in Feltskin, which is a little bit like Jennifer Aniston investing in the Burevors business. You know what I mean? It's like it caught the attention of South Africa, right? And um, so we had him, them, and now we're building a business, you know, and we've got these celebrities. Uh, we've now got other people that wear the shoes. I mean, right now, Matthew McConaughey almost only wears Feltskin. And if you look on the internet, it's he's everywhere. If you see him now on photograph, his big thing that he did on YouTube, he was wearing a pair of J-Bay Feltskins. And uh, we're struggling to find out how. <laughs> we don't know. And do you find it drives the sales tremendously to do those things? No. It, it, yes and no. Was it just the excitement of knowing it's the excitement. that those uh, kind of people are wearing your shoes? Yes. And people think celebrity endorsement automatically equals success. It doesn't actually work like that. Or let's say these big moments, right? You make the front page of the business day or Brian Joffe invests in your business. What it does do is it gives you very good visibility and it lifts your business a tiny bit. But what it lifts the entire business is tiny bit. So you don't spike. It doesn't do that. It lifts, but what it does do is it stays at that point. And then it grows slower again, slower again, and then you have a big moment and then it lifts a little bit higher. So the base gets bigger and bigger. But like you know... Business is about time. It takes long. It's not about spikes. And uh, people often think, I'll get a celebrity endorsement. And I think this is where that influencer world may be a little bit grabby, is that it's like, if I can just get them to say they love the shoes, then I'm going to be a success. It simply doesn't work like that. It, you, you'd be very disappointed by those results. Um, I'm not saying if Kim Kardashian said she adores Feltskin, it wouldn't work. Of course, I'm sure. But in our world, with those types of celebrities that we've had, it's it's not, it, it, it's surprisingly, it's it's powerful, but not in the way you think it is. Because if you look from a media point of view, there are these spikes that tend to rise to the surface with Falskin. Yeah. If you look at obviously Prince Harry, hmm. then Ashton and Mark. Yeah. Um, and then obviously you've got a couple of other stories, and two of those stories that I think are really, really beautiful is the one is the Olympics. Hmm. And the second story is the DHL initiative in Europe. Yeah. Um, I'd love for you just to unpack those two for me. Yeah. So, yeah, listen, it was, it was moving. And I think I'll deal, I'll deal with the Olympics first. Because on a timeline, I think it was pre-DHL. Yes. Yes. It was pre-DHL, yeah. So, COVID happens. Now, remember, we're flying high with Ashton Kutcher and Mark Cuban. Like everyone, we're facing imminent uh, end as a business. We go through COVID with pain, but somehow we grow our international footprint because we're digital and we, we could pivot and we try to raise currency outside of South Africa. We built a bunch of territories, but we are in deep trouble like many other businesses. And in this moment, it actually just before I'd asked we were coming up to the Olympics in 2019, um, or 20, 2020, I think it was supposed to be. We, and so just before that, Nick Latouf, an early guy in our business, made the recommendation, we should try to be on the next Olympics. But we had no idea how to do that. And it's, it's a strange thing to have to try and solve. How do you get onto the athletes? So he recommended I actually make a video, and, I'm, and still on our Facebook page, if you watch me, there's a video of me asking South Africa for help saying, hi guys, Nick here from Falskin. We really would like to be on the Olympics team. We don't really know how to do that. If there's anyone else there that, out in South Africa that can help us, please get in touch. Ravi, the CEO of Sascog, phones me the next day on my phone. I didn't know who he was. Phones me and goes, Nick, it's Ravi, I'm the CEO of Sascog. I hear you're looking for me. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my God. And I tell him the story and he's like, listen, we've got to make this work. You guys have to have your shoes on the Olympians. So we're so enthused. COVID comes. We're struggling to keep our business alive. But we've got this Olympic dream. And of course, Tokyo gets cancelled. Okay. So Tokyo gets cancelled. The next thing, now it's been pushed out by a full year. As we come out of COVID, Tokyo starts to, the, there might be a games. And... We start talking about it, and, the, and Saskock says, yes, we're going to do this with you. And just before, about I think it was about four months before the Games, 
the great South African retailer, Mr. Price, buys the headline sponsorship for the team. And I got the news at about five o'clock in the afternoon off the newswire, EWN. Mr. Price announces major sponsorship for the South African Olympic team. And I thought, God, we're, you know, we're toast, surely. You're not going to buy the sponsorship for the Olympics and not have the opening games, the mm, opening yeah. ceremony, right? Yeah. So I thought we were toast. So I phone Ravi. He's like, just relax. I don't know what's going to happen. Just let me, just give me time. And I think it took a couple of days. And it's one of the great South African stories. You and I were talking earlier. There's so much to be critical of in South Africa, specifically in like service. Sascock did one of the coolest things for a small business in South Africa. They fought for our sponsorship. And it was because they had shook hands with us. And they fought to have Falskin included at the opening ceremony and to be the off-field gear for the athletes. And on its own, you'd think, wow, that's amazing. But the second piece, which is also amazing, is that Mr. Price, the great retailer, saw that it was the right thing to do. Sure. And accepted that Falskin should be at the opening ceremony. Because mm. it was a small business, it, was, it represented something it represented a cool story. Three months later, my team and I, we sadly couldn't go because nobody could go. We all got together. There's a great clip of it on our pages, watching the team come out and our team just going nuts and crying like a, I cried like a baby, sobbed like a baby because it was so emotional seeing this happen. It was this great full brand story. You just couldn't, you couldn't comprehend that we'd come out of COVID survived that, somehow managed to get this done, somehow managed to get the athletes to Japan. And then it was cathartic. It was this really special, special moment. Um, sure. And then we, what happened in that moment was people knew globally, it wasn't a global story, but we were the footwear, we were a footwear business. We weren't just felt skin, we were a footwear business. So, Second thing that happens is DHL, which I'll, I'll spend less time on, but it was just as interesting. DHL phones us and they go, after the Olympics, say, Nick, we'd like to work with you. I actually bumped into the guy at a swimming pool. And he was like, are you Nick Dreyer from Felskin? I was like, yeah, he goes, I need to come and talk to you. I'm with DHL. I didn't know who he was. Um, turns out he's the, he helps manage the entire sponsorship portfolio for DHL. So I thought DHL was coming to do DHL logos on their shoes. So him and the head of marketing, Meg, come to see us and they tell us the story about DHL being one of the big fashion collaborators on planet Earth and that they'd collaborated with a French couture brand called Vetement, V-E-T-E-M-E-N-T-S, which means couture in, in French. Yeah. And that they'd done this collaboration and Billie Eilish wore the clothes and it was so cool and they used their power as the distributor for or the, the distribution partner for all the fashion weeks in the world and it had become one of the top collaborations Vogue voted it one of the top 10 fashion collaborations of all time and DHL had chosen us to potentially do the next collaboration a company from Africa they wanted an African brand and they chose us so he said yeah, okay, cool. What do we need to do? They said, you need to get the attention of the entire fashion world and you need a product that you could launch at Paris Fashion Week. Wow. Now, I'll remind you, not long ago, we had an argument about why fashion felt going to weren't that cool. Okay, so I was a little nervous. <laughs> like, <laughs> is it going to be good enough for Paris Fashion Week? So we had to come up with a product. We came up with a crazy sneaker, a felt skin sneaker, 365 of them. And we had a campaign with DHL called Dear Everyone. Just after COVID, we felt that as we were Africans down here in the cradle of humankind, we should write a letter to the whole world to remind them, to remind all of us that it's going to be okay. And sure. that strange combinations, even DHL and Feltskin, if we come together, interesting and beautiful things can happen because that's what humanity is like. So we wrote this letter called the Dear Everyone Letter. It was published at scale, and then we made 365 shoes to celebrate it. We launched it in London in Mayfair. It launched at Selfridges, and we put 365 on a drop lottery, and I think we sold out in 12 minutes or something. And there are collectible items now, and almost nobody in South Africa knew about it because, of course, it's not a story here. 
But we made the front page of L Fashion in uh, online. We made the front page of Business Insider globally. It was a huge, huge, huge fashion moment. And the cool thing is, is that these shoes will be around forever. They're actually being traded on the second secondary market as a collectible now. So, yeah, Falskin got validated as a fashion product. What's amazing is that the dream back in 2015 was to make Falskin fashionable. Yeah. And that story is almost the embodiment of that dream, yeah. in a sense. Um, it was the fulfillment of the dream that you and your partner had back then. It's like, mm. how do we make Falskin fashionable? Mm. And... The greatest place to do it is at the Paris, Paris Fashion Week. Yes. It's the biggest fashion week yeah. in the world. And the most lovely, beautiful South African that I know, Minid Lamini, wore them in Paris and leaked them. You know, like in true celebrity style. How cool is that? It got picked up all over the world. Great moment. So coming back, so let's land back in South Africa now. Mm. And I know you have a huge heart for South Africa mm. just as a country. So in terms of manufacturing locally, yes. let us just unpack that a little bit. Okay, so that's the non-negotiable in Falskin shoes. If you think about 300 years of brand equity, the one thing it had to and will always have to be is made here. It's not just romantic. It's because we, had, we have genuinely skilled craftsmen that make some of the best products in the world, not just footwear. Now, a Falskin has to be... Th I always like to say a Falskin feels a little bit like a South African. It's got <laughs> characteristics that feel like us. The first thing is it's really well made. If I asked every South African in South Africa, what are the, tell me the traits of a Falskin, they're gonna go, it's tough as hell. It's well made. We are well made. We've been put through the fire. We're like hardened steel. We've come through moments that are tougher than anywhere else in the world, but we come to it through it together. So we're well made, we're powerful. The second thing is a Falskin has to be unfathomably comfortable. You have to have it for 50 years sometimes. People boast that you know, my great grandfather gave me his felt skin. A felt skin has to be comfortable. And I put it to you that I think South Africans are comfortable. I've, I'm yet to meet a foreigner that says, geez, like, I love you. This is the guy that I work with, a South African. Or a team that goes, geez, like, you know, the South African acts that play on our team. They're the best guys. We're just a comfortable nation. I think we're, we're, we're familiar and we've, we've got humor. And then the third thing that I think a Falskin is exactly the same as a South African is that it doesn't take itself too seriously. You know, we're not a... I love we, that. We, awesome. we don't take ourselves too seriously. We, we, we in the terms of the shoe, we're not going to end up in the Gucci boutiques of the world. We might, but we'll also end up at a, a Spaza shop next to the road. Falskin is for everyone. Everyone, because that's what South Africa is about. And we don't take ourselves too seriously. So it doesn't matter if a CEO or a waiter is wearing the same shoes. That's what makes us us. And we don't take ourselves too seriously. We know that it's tough out there, but we like life. So when it came to the manufacturing, you tell me, knowing all of those things, how are you going to get a Spaniard to make a pair of shoes that feels like us? It's not possible. I don't care about how well it's made or the history or... or a Spanish guy or a Chinese guy, I need a South African to make the shoe that makes us us. And that will never change with Falskin. And, if, and we will protect that because we genuinely believe South Africa makes amazing things and services. And Falskin needs to be a symbol for that. And we will not make it anywhere else. So all those, every single shoe is made in South Africa, in Durban. Made in Durban with a unbelievably strong partner, Hopewell Shoes, third generational footwear company. Again, we're not, we're not talking about us like learning how to do this for the first time. So Falskin has been around for a long time. Stitch down technology, comfort, all of that stuff. So much technology goes into our shoes that people just don't know. But it's, they are world class. And, and Falskin is not the only thing. I, I mean, you can go to the CMT factories in Cape Town and see some of the sewing work that there's a company, a leather company in Cape Town uh, Cobra leather, that makes some of the most world-class expensive things you've ever seen in your life. And then you've got people with services and companies that are bastions of excellence and performance in South Africa. Um, we must just keep reminding ourselves that that exists and I don't think we should look elsewhere to provide these things. We should yeah. be doing them at home. So a huge, a huge part of that by producing locally there is a social element as well to uplift South Africa in a sense. Yes. So on a social element side of the business, I know 
from a social point of view, it's a big part of not only the business, but also for you personally. Yes. Um, just unpack some of the social initiatives that Feltcon is involved in yeah. um, a little bit for us. We realized, we realized early, okay, so there's what you want to do because you believe in it, and then there's the, the, there's the advertising or the marketing reasons why people do stuff. So if you look at some other products, it's like buy this so that I can give something else to someone else that needs it. Buy this and you'll protect the rainforests. Buy this and you'll protect something else. We look at it and we go, I think sustainability and social impact in South Africa is, is far more complex than the rest of the world. So the temptation is to say, you need to use a sustainable material. It's almost like saying, I need to have a sustainably milked almond for my cappuccino. I don't think South Africa is, that's got anything to do with us. It's an element of us, but what we're really about is community. Sustainability in South Africa is a community issue. Now, if you look at Feldskin, we start by there's a farmer with a cow, then it moves into a meat product cycle, very humanely done. Then you move into the raw material part, then you move into the soles, then you move into the laces, then you move into it arriving at the factory, then you arrive at humans, not robots, putting it together. That supply chain is either going to be four to five people and three robots big, or it's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of people big. It has to be thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people big. That is what is required. So we're not vertically integrated, and I'm not saying that's the wrong way, I'm also a capitalist, but we recognize that the more shoes we make, the bigger that gets. I'll give you one direct example. It takes 60 pairs of hands to make one pair of our shoes, one. Now you tell me what happens when you go from 10,000 to a million. How many hands are you gonna need? That's crazy. That's crazy, yeah. but it's what we need in the country. That is what our social impact is going to be. And we share that out loud and we say to people, it's not just us, we'll make the shoes, but we'll find good reasons for you to buy them. But people with deep pockets, specifically corporates, not just here, but in, in the US and the UK, need to think about how they procure. They need to procure in smart ways where it affects greater community. Yes, of course, people do well along the line. Let's get like recognize that, put it on the table. But companies like ours are trying to build, I've coined this thing, we're trying to make the pizza bigger. I'm not trying to get a bigger slice. And people need to understand that. So our social, our sustainable conversation sits every, in every single step of our supply chain. And we don't ignore the environment, for example. You know, through us we, we, and, and partners, we, we've, we've facilitated and planted thousands and thousands of speckworm the greatest plant in the world that turns carbon monoxide into oxygen at our factory to offset our carbon emissions. So you have to be cognizant of all of these things across the entire supply chain, but it can't just be a ethically milked almond. Mm. That's not good enough. That might be good enough somewhere else, but in an African or specifically a South African context, it's far more complex and it's far more difficult and you have to be far more committed in order to get it done at scale. One of my, one of my favorite stories that I've heard you tell before is um, the whole flip-flop initiative. So at the time when Falskin started, there was also a flip-flop that was that was mm. behind the scenes somehow. Sure. And then there's the whole story with the SA Rescue. Yes. Um, CN Rescue. Yes. Walk us through that story a little bit. What an institution. I think it's a national treasure, the National Sea Rescue Institute of South Africa, the NSRI. And so when Feltskin started, Rosten actually recognized that Feltskin was not the only product out there. The other one was the Plucky. <laughs> and the Plucky is, this, is the cheeky sister or brother of Feltskin. Because South Africans wear flip-flops. They wear pluckies. We call every plucky a plucky, by the way. It doesn't matter where you buy it. The only problem that we thought is that how many are we importing into this country? And we thought, why aren't we making a plucky in South Africa? Turns out it's pretty tough to make a plucky in South Africa. And we call it our five-year overnight success because <laughs> it's been hard. Eh? Long story short, we get to a point where we can create a plucky. And our, our dream for a plucky was that it had to be more affordable and longer lasting than our competitors. 
We're friendly with our friends in South America, but we wanted one for us. So it took time, got it right. And one of the first places we were, and we like to support initiatives, and we came up with this initiative, we learned about this initiative called the Pink is for Boys initiative with the NSRI, where they're putting up life-saving buoys at water sources where they are not lifeguards. And there's way more places where there's water that are not guarded by lifeguards than where they are. So river sources, inland sources, there's so many places that are, and people sadly die of drowning a lot. So they came to us and we said, listen, let's bring out a pink is for boys plucky, garish, hot pink thing, play, beautiful play on words, pink is for boys. And um, every time we sell 10, I think, or 12 pluckies, we'll pay to put up a life-saving buoy. And just so you know, this life-saving buoy comes on a stand and it has a buoy on it with rope and it won an international prize for design. And the NSRI is, is world-class leader in, in life-saving technology and this won a global prize for it. And we thought, yes, see, this is a cool thing. Let's make our pluckies and then every time we sell X, we'll put one up with the proceeds. Yes, and you know, with these things, you always like money flows, right? And you think, okay, cool, I'm doing a good thing. I think we launched it on the Tuesday. I'll get my dates wrong or the timing wrong, but let's say for the argument's sake, it's a Tuesday. And Friday, the first one went up. Saturday morning, Ross phones me. He says, the guys at the NRSI just phoned. The life-saving buoy that we put up on a, I think it was at a river, on the Saturday morning had saved a 21-year-old boy from drowning. It gives me chills now oh. thinking about it because you you think you make an impact and you don't really know until you get a phone call like that so sure. less moral of the story is not we do a small we're such a small cog of support for the nsri look them up if you don't know enough about the nsri the work that they do in this country is the work of angels it is incredible it is a world-class organization that are fully funded by the public. So they need help and they do a great, great, great job. That's absolutely incredible. Mm. So in terms of just the landing this plane now. Um, the plane's just got off the runway, man. <laughs> <laughs> we're so, trying to figure out how to fly. <laughs> so, at least we're still figuring it out, so it'll yeah. be all right. Um, coming, coming, obviously understanding South Africa as a country, mm. understanding um, our mentality and how we built. I love the way you framed that South Africans are very much like a false good um, in terms of how it's made and how we are made. Um, in terms of a young person in South Africa, yeah. um, looking to start a business here, what is some of the advice that you would give to them? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's an important question. It's a good question. It's an important question. We live in a country where there is still opportunity, okay? And that's difficult to say about other places. A young person in South Africa needs to focus their mind on the fact that South Africa is a feasible place to do amazing things. Don't ignore the fact that it's difficult. That's hard. But if you focus on being excellent at what you want to do and if you've got an idea that you're willing to pursue and you're willing to work hard entrepreneurial spirit knows that an entrepreneurial journey is like an assault on every single part of your being it's bloody difficult you don't sleep you're not healthy it's horrible i don't recommend being an entrepreneur to anyone <laughs> but we need them so that young south africans need to take stock of their environment Make sure that they're prepared to go hard, long, and on a difficult journey. But the biggest thing they need to do is start. They need to begin. Ross and I registered Feldskin PTY Limited on Sipsy in a car journey. You need to start. It doesn't matter if you're funded. It doesn't matter if you don't have any idea where it's going to come from. The biggest obstacle to young people starting businesses in South Africa is themselves. Sure. They convince themselves that it's, I need this before I can start. I need that before I can start. I hear it all the time. You know, yeah, but I need funding or yeah, I need this or I need that. The reality is, yes, you do. But you're not going to go and get it until you've begun. Start. 
Get the ball rolling. It doesn't matter how small that ball, ball is, but get the ball rolling. Start. We need more people starting businesses in South Africa. And the next thing, I'll always say this. Don't look at YouTube at what business is or at what entrepreneurship is. Nobody needs another Facebook in Africa. We do not need a loss-making unicorn and some guy telling us how to get a startup that will turn $50,000 in a day. And No one needs that. Yes, if you've got that dream, pursue it. I don't want to get in your way. But what we need here is going concerns, small enterprises that can grow. But first, do it in a responsible way that can look after your immediate community, whether that be your family or your friends or the people that you employ. Get into the space where you can be a going concern. That's more important now than trying to work out how to get $5 million worth of funding in order to create some loss-making mechanism that might one day turn into something. Figure out how to do something that turns into actual money that can actually make your life better. Sure. And be very careful of the advice that we get on Instagram and on Reels and stuff. Stay off that. Get get serious about turning a buck into a buck twenty, and then you'll then you'll get somewhere. And I think that's such a beautiful way to to go into the last question that I just want to ask you is if you have one or two business stories or business quotes that just really stand out in your mind. Mm. Um, what are those two stories that just really are just that little drop of motivation yeah. in your mind that just keeps you going? Yeah, the, so the first one is, and it's actually, I, I use it a lot now, even though it was way more relevant at the beginning of the business. Peter Thiel, the great um, investor, funnily enough, I've just ranted on about loss making unicorns. He's one of the greatest investors into those. So he wrote a book called Zero to One. And he had a line in there which I love, which is if you've if you're not embarrassed by your launch, you've gone too late. <laughs> but it it talks to my point about starting. If you if you think you're gonna start perfectly, you're you're not. You're 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 either not gonna do it or you're gonna go too late. And that's relevant to Feltzkin because we launched shoes that didn't exist. But we started. Were they great? No, they don't even exist. In fact, our first shoes were terrible. But we we launched. We had a good idea. We got going. Started fixing problems, which is 90% of the time was what you're doing as an entrepreneur is fixing stuff. So don't be afraid to go too early. And we use it today. Like even if we're starting off a new campaign or whatever, we, we often question ourselves and go, hang on, are we laboring this a little bit too much or should we just go? And that has served me very well. Don't be, don't be sloppy. Of course not. But be brave enough to go early. I think that's, that's always stood me really well. And then the, the other thing that motivates me, one of, one of the great quotes, and I'll give it to my business partner, Ross Zonda, who is one of the great business partners anyone could ever wish for, because we're not just friends, we're family, and we believe in each other. But he gave me a piece of advice early on, I don't know if he gave it to me, but he, he said it. And I actually take that as maybe gospel now. Business is about survival. The longer you're in it, the better it goes. And you can see it with great businesses like yourselves. If you're in it for a long time, there's a natural growth that happens. There's a conservative fiscal health that develops over time. Yeah. And if you're struggling today, and I struggle, we're a business. There's days when you just go, this can't possibly be what this is about. <laughs> like, or you go, how am I going to solve this? You just, we all have them. I mean, I've just done a thing around burnout uh, in the mental health space. And I, I admit on camera, I read this thing about burnout and I realized I'm burning out. You know, yeah. being in business is tough. When it comes to those days, remind yourself of the mantra, business is about survival. If you can get through today and get through tomorrow and the day after, and you take it one day at a time, even an hour at a time, you're on the right path. You will survive sure. if you keep trying to survive. But don't, don't bamboozle yourself. It's hard. It's tough. It needs focus. It needs clarity of mind. It needs hard work beyond anything you can do. But if you can get through to tomorrow, you've done the job. Sure. Nick, 
Thank you so much for the opportunity just to speak to you about Falskin's journey. Obviously, it's it's been a wild one. Um, and it's, it's Wild's been, a good description. <laughs> and it's been inspirational to say the least because it's, I just love what you said earlier that just, just start. Yeah. And as a young person, that's a huge, that's a huge thing. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't start. They, yeah. they talk about starting, but they don't actually do it. So yeah. we have far more people talking about doing something instead of just acting on it. Yeah. Um, and I just love the fact that you've acted on it yeah. and you're doing it and you, you're selling shoes in South Africa and people love your shoes and mm. people love your shoes in the UK. And, and it's just, it's incredible to watch you grow and watch your business grow. And I just, I just wish you all the best in, in terms of your future endeavors mm. and how the business will grow into the future. And I just want to say thank you again for coming onto the podcast today. And mm. thank you so much for the opportunity for me to speak to you today. It's a massive pleasure. Like I said, it's a privilege for us to tell our story. Thank you for your platform. Um, and wishing you success with the podcast and with business in general. Um, the, I'll end off by saying, I said it earlier on, it's nice to talk to nice people. Okay. And it's also nice to talk to people that believe in South Africa. And I know you do deeply. And um, may you grow and may your business be successful for generations to come. And um, let's just all enjoy where we are. And thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Appreciate that. <laughs>